tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Another deadly avalanche in B.C. This is a travesty for all those that are involved. The most dangerous conditions in decades and the warning ahead. Plus, a shifting scene on a once thriving downtown Vancouver street. It's supposed to be your entertainment district where all the tourists come to. I say this is what they see in Vancouver. It's sort of embarrassing. Why the increase in violence in the Granville Entertainment District has some pushing for revitalization with an emphasis on safety. And a shortage of volunteers nationwide. They're seeing what they're referring to as a crisis in volunteering right now. So few people willing to lend a hand. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Anita Bath. Two brothers have been killed and a third person is injured after an avalanche near Revelstoke. It's the latest in a series of deadly slides in this province. The CBC's Dan Burrett joins us live now with more. Dan, take us through what happened yesterday. Anita, three people were caught in the avalanche Monday afternoon while on a guided heliskiing tour. The victims have been identified as 59-year-old John and 57-year-old Tim Kinsley. They are businessmen and brothers from Pennsylvania. The third victim is their guide with Banff-based CMH heli skiing. The company says all three were found by their transceivers and taken to Kelowna General Hospital. Their injured guide is in stable condition. In a statement, CMH heli skiing says, the thousands of guests who ski with us each winter are our family. It's impossible to put into words the sorrow that we feel and the sadness that is shared by our guests, their families, and all of our staff. Another person, meanwhile, was taken to hospital yesterday after being caught in a separate avalanche near Cherryville, north of Kelowna. Uh, this is a travesty for all those that are involved. I know that the companies that uh, take people up into those areas take every precaution and that they deal with their clients very, very closely prior to. Obviously, uh, the experts on those crews know what to expect, um, and sometimes Mother Nature just has different plans. Five people have now been killed in avalanches in B.C. so far this season. That includes two off-duty Nelson police officers near Caslow and a snowmobiler near Valmont. Yeah, Dan, conditions particularly bad this year. So what are officials telling people who want to head into the backcountry? Well, Avalanche Canada tells people they need to avoid avalanche terrain, even if they're experts. It says this season's snowpack is unusually weak with conditions that only happen once every decade or two, the government is pleading with people to be prepared and extremely careful. They're comparing these conditions to 2003, when 29 people were killed in avalanches in Western Canada. These conditions are likely to last for a long time, especially in the interior and the northwest part of our province. Avalanche Canada says it cannot close the backcountry, nor would it try to do so. But it warns if you do go out, even with all the right safety gear and all the right training, you could trigger a deadly slide. Anita. Dan Burrett, live tonight. Thank you. We're getting more information about yesterday's eight-hour closure of southbound lanes on the Alex Fraser Bridge. Delta police are speaking out today, saying the decision to close the lanes was for safety reasons, guided by their priority to save a life. Police say a number of frustrated drivers became a threat to the person at risk and to officers. Some drivers walked up the bridge deck, interfered with the case, and even took videos of the person in crisis. Others honked horns, yelled, and drove through the barricade. One impaired driver was issued a 90-day driving suspension and a 30-day vehicle impound. The Delta Police Department stands by its decision to close the lanes, but says it will review the incident to lessen the impact on the public in the future. Well, tonight we have an update on a CBC investigation into the death of a 14-year-old Indigenous girl whose body was found in a downtown Eastside apartment last year. Our journalists have now unsealed a search warrant relevant to the investigation. As Michelle Gassou reports, it reveals police had previously conducted a search of the apartment where Noelle Soup was found dead. Noelle Soup's body was found in this apartment in the downtown Eastside several months after she died. The remains of the 14-year-old and an adult woman were missed in an initial police search of the apartment when police found tenant Van Chung Pham dead of an overdose. The documents obtained by CBC reveal police had searched the one-room unit less than a year before as they investigated Pham for sexual assault. 
my spirit like left my body and it was like I was just laying there and I could just see what was going on but not being able to do anything. This woman says she was sexually assaulted by Pham in his apartment in November 2020. She went to the hospital and two weeks later reported the assault to police. I felt like I just had to do it so I did it right away. Police then applied for a search warrant for the Heatley Block apartment, which has now been unsealed by CBC for the first time. It reveals how police investigated Pham, going off only the name Jimmy, a description of his appearance and his cell phone number. Police accessed a database that uses GPS information to track the movement of cell phones. Pham's cell phone data tied him definitively to the Heatley Block, revealing he was there 49% of the time and mostly between the hours of 1 a.m. and 10 a.m. The document also says a detective with the sex crimes unit spoke with Pham's landlord, who says he paid rent through social services and would frequently bring women to his apartment. The contents of the search warrant raise as many questions as they answer, like why police didn't find Noel Soup's body in apartment 16, especially since they'd searched it before and were actively investigating an alleged sexual assault that had taken place inside. Police said Pham was a hoarder, making the bodies impossible to find. Pham's alleged victim remembers the apartment differently. He kept it pretty clean all the time. I think he was very specific about that. He made his bed. Inside the apartment, police searched for a black leather couch, a small bed, a green 1990s-style blanket, and cellular phones. All items that could corroborate the account of the sexual assault. Noello Soup's family says they're grateful to the young woman who reported her assault to police. I sympathize with her, you know, empathy goes towards her. And, uh, but yeah, it just goes to show what a strong woman she is to be able to do that. But, you know, it just seems like the RCMP and the VPD down there are just not doing their job as properly as they should be. The Vancouver Police Department not commenting on the case as the deaths of Noel and the adult woman are still under investigation by the VPD's major crime unit. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. A man who dug up fossilized dinosaur footprints from a protected area in northern BC has been fined and sentenced to nearly a month in jail. The Six Peaks Dinosaur Track site contained more than 500 dinosaur footprints like these across the 750 square meters of land. And a provincial court has now ruled that Benward Dale, Ingram and three others extracted the tracks from the site near Hudson's Hope using power tools and a sledgehammer. The individuals only stopped their two-hour excavations when witnesses showed up causing considerable damage. When you start removing those things, you're really removing information that helps you interpret the entire track site. Uh, there's some really interesting things uh, in that track site, like there's there's a spot where it really looks like one of the dinosaurs like slipped in the mud. And, you know, if you start removing things like that, you're going to lose that kind of context. The Six Peaks Dinosaur Track Site has been protected under the Provincial Land Act since 2016, making it illegal to use the land for anything other than conservation and preservation. A BC Securities Commission panel has ruled a souk man defrauded an investor in a well-known Vancouver Island hotel. The case centers around the ownership of the Souk Harbour Hotel house. Timothy Gray Craig Durkin told an investor that his holding company owned the hotel when in fact it didn't. The panel found that false statements about the ownership led the investor to advance $1 million for shares in the hotel. The money has never been recovered and the hotel remains closed for renovations with no timeline for reopening. A totem pole taken from the Newhawk First Nation in 1912 by the Royal BC Museum is now being returned. Newhawk Nation hereditary chief Derek Snow's great-grandfather carved the totem pole in the 1800s. According to records, it was transferred to the Royal BC Museum for only $45. But Snow doesn't believe the family's totem pole would have just been given away. We have a hard time believing that because... Uh, you know, grave posts are grave posts in our tradition. And we always have to take care of our, our, our people that have passed on. The museum said it would return it in 2019, but when Snow didn't see any progress, he took legal action last year. And two weeks ago, the museum finally caved. It is expected to arrive back in Newhawk in mid-February. 
Well, the Yekoche First Nation has announced a declaration today that affirms its unceded lands and resources. What they're doing through the, the declaration is they're, they're putting uh, Canada and the province of British Columbia on notice that uh, they, they fully intend to use their own customs and laws, uh, policies and processes. The B.C. government passed the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, or DRIPA for short, in 2019. McPherson says the declaration gives the First Nation more bargaining power after treaty negotiations have stalled for 27 years. Well, the federal conservative leader is in town to kick off consultations with First Nation communities and industry. Pierre Polyev is looking at new approaches so First Nations can have more control over their revenue stream. He says these would be optional and would not affect any First Nations treaty rights or existing funding agreements with the government. There are obviously going to be questions that we need to work out. And that's why we're consulting and listening to the people most affected and with the most knowledge. Aside from the resources that and the benefits that we get off of resource uh, development in our territories, it'll advance our communities into better quality of life. Aliyev says consultations will continue across the country with the help of his shadow cabinet. Vancouver Mayor Ken Sim addressed members of the business community today, speaking to the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade in his first State of the City address since being elected. He used the opportunity to suggest under his office the so-called no-fun city might soon shake that title. I envision a Vancouver in the not-so-distant future that is super exciting again. A Vancouver with a renewed swagger. Yes, the annual event hosted by the Hotel Vancouver saw Sim presenting the crowd with his vision for the city, saying he hopes to instill a renewed sense of confidence and swagger. For more on this, including how Sim hopes to generate some of that excitement, a man with no shortage of swagger himself, Justin McElroy, live with us tonight. Justin, obviously one word stuck out here in particular, but what was the actual substance of this speech? Yeah, Anita, it was a little bit of looking back over the first 101 days since he defeated Kennedy Stewart last October, but looking forward as well, he talked to a Board of Trade audience about small businesses, about activating industry in Vancouver. He also talked a lot about housing, of course, the high price of getting into the market, and particularly there was one line that struck a lot of observers. Vancouver does not have a shadow crisis. Vancouver does not have a view cone crisis. In Vancouver, we have a housing crisis. Okay. Now, the reference he was making there is to the city's view cone policy. Basically, there are a lot of different sections throughout the city that uh, have a protected view of the mountains. You can see one of them right there that impedes what exactly developers can build on land. So between talking about that, talking about shadows, which obviously is another place where people against some of these bigger developments sometimes put their arguments, he's saying and signaling that Vancouver is going to build, build more, build higher. We'll see exactly what that leads to in the years ahead. Okay, and obviously there's a big focus on Vancouver's vibes here, but are there any specifics at this point? Uh, there were a few, but this was not a speech about this. That was It was a big picture speech, an optimistic speech, and also you could see the mayor starting to transition from the type of person that was campaigning for the job to one that now has the job and has to create different expectations for the role. There was one question brought to him at one point about uh, crime and safety and being asked when exactly people could expect results. And have listen to his response. When can we expect that there will be a marked change? You know, that's something that I can't answer. I, I can give you color, mm -hmm. but you know, I can't wave a magic wand and say by, you know, October 15th of this year, you know, everything's going to be fine. He said he didn't want to overpromise. He said it was more important of what could happen 10 years down the line rather than in one year. But just one of those things that happens when you go from campaigning to the job for having it, how you start playing the expectation game a little bit more for all sorts of reasons. Justin McElroy reporting live for us tonight. Thank you, Justin. Well, sticking in Vancouver and the issue of crime, it's been a violent few weeks in the city's Granville Entertainment District, from shootings and bear spray attacks to other problems stemming from social issues. But as Janella Hamilton reports, the hope is the area can be revitalized with a stronger sense of safety. 
Well known as the city's neon colored nightlife hotspot, the scene on the Granville Strip is shifting. We're currently dealing with not just the traditional issues and the challenges that we face with the bars and the clubs, but also a lot of public safety issues related to um, uh, addiction, mental health, antisocial behavior, um, violent behavior. Over the past two weeks, a shooting left a 32 year old man with life threatening injuries. A store employee was attacked with bear spray during a robbery at London Drugs. A man was arrested after police say he took a gun into a pub and most recently a stabbing outside a bar at Granville in Smythe. What we've been seeing is more and more people who are using weapons, physical force, um, whether it be bear spray, knives, needles, guns, real or fake. Along with the rise in violence, some parts of the streets are lined with garbage. A recent survey from Goodnight Out Vancouver found 89% of 231 respondents feel unsafe in the Granville Entertainment District. It's not safe, it's dirty, it... You don't really know who you're going to run into. Um, there's just a lot of uncertainty. This woman lives in the neighborhood. She says she's been chased home by strangers and had to duck in stores and restaurants. Um, I definitely I don't walk down this street that often. It's a very rare occasion. The VPD says more officers will be patrolling the area and targeted enforcement will focus on those deemed chronic repeat offenders. Councillor Sarah Kirby Young says safety is her number one priority for the neighborhood. And you want to make sure that people feel that they can go out and enjoy themselves, whether it's during the day or the nighttime. To that end, the city is planning an 18 month Granville Street planning program aimed at cultural and economic revitalization between Robson and Drake Streets. It will look at ways to increase hotel developments and improve rezoning policies and allow for time to make upgrades to social housing units in the area. Council will vote on the report at the end of January. So separate from the planning initiative, we are investing additionally in providing support for street cleanup and sanitation. Moves she hopes will bring a safe hustle and bustle back to Granville Street. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. And over on Broadway, a major breakthrough for the SkyTrain extension as the first of two tunnel boring machines drilled a hole into what will be Mount Pleasant Station Wall. Named Elsie after BC-born aircraft designer Elizabeth McGill, this machine and its counterpart called Phyllis will take about one year to journey from Great Northern Way Emily Carr Station to Cypress Street near the future Arbuta Station. The extension is projected to be completed in 2026. Well, YVR wants to hear directly from the public. Those who experienced the travel disruptions over this past holiday season, the public engagement process is in addition to their operational review of what happened in the chaos. They are using consultation methods like an online feedback form, focus groups and panels, and are accepting written submissions. The first phase of engagement starts at the end of the month where participants can share input on key areas. And a second phase will last through February for more detailed input. Well, there's a dire shortage of volunteers hitting charities and service groups across the country. And for some organizations, it means cutting back on the help they're able to provide. Renee Filipponi shows us where it's hitting hard. Kids too. Gay Long delivers more than food oh, for housebound kids, Vancouverites. Too? It's also okay. about safety. It's the only voice that they hear. And, um, and it's a check on them too, to make sure that they aren't um, in a precarious situation. So today is um, fish. She uses her e-bike to deliver meals on wheels and is urging others to sign up. And I want to be able to keep this service going in case I ever need it or someone I love needs it. Other similar delivery programs have recently shut down because of a lack of volunteers. They're seeing what they're referring to as a crisis in volunteering right now. According to recent numbers from Statistics Canada, 67% of organizations report a shortage of new volunteers. More than half have challenges with retention, and 35% of groups say their services are suffering. Priorities shifted in the pandemic, and many individuals are not um, prioritizing volunteering in the same way. Volunteer Canada says health concerns for volunteers who are seniors may be holding them back, and the high cost of living is an issue. They might be hidden barriers in terms of the cost to get to and from a volunteer opportunity, uh, the cost of childcare to, um, that might be needed while they're volunteering. Big Brothers pairs kids in need with a mentor. 
In Surrey, the volunteer crunch has forced them to temporarily stop signing up new kids. The average wait time for a child to be matched in Surrey is about two years. For Girl Guides, the volunteer shortage is paired with increased need as more people search for a sense of community post-pandemic. We can't continue to keep up with the demand from girls until and unless we have more adult women come forward to be role models and catalysts for girl empowerment. 1,200 girls are currently on the wait list in BC alone. Volunteer for a group that, like a group of people that need help. Would you rather volunteer inside? Girls who will likely be the next generation of volunteers. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. A Fisheries and Oceans Canada report says there is no statistical connection between fish farms and sea lice found on wild salmon. Critics are skeptical, as past studies have shown that fish farmers undercount sea lice. This is all industry data. It's been shown to be unreliable. It was a very clumsy analysis, and it does nothing to refute all of the detailed science from the major universities of Canada. The BC Salmon Farmers Association has declared the report as proof that farms are safe, even as the report notes that sea lice infestations are growing along the coast and can be harmful to wild juvenile salmon. Critics maintain that more diligent research is needed to monitor sea lice. A new study suggests traffic pollution can impair brain function in a matter of hours. Researchers from the University of Victoria and UBC found that just two hours of exposure to diesel exhaust causes a decrease in the brain's functional connectivity, a measure of how different areas of the brain interact and communicate with each other. Uh, the fu functional connectivity is essentially a map of the network of the neural connections or the um, or the nervous system connections in the brain. And we all have this basic connectivity map. Um, what we showed is that in individuals exposed to diesel exhaust, we compared them to their own state uh, without that diesel exhaust or with a control or placebo uh, clean air. Uh, that neural network or, or functional connectivity map um, was disturbed. Researchers say that for the study, 25 healthy adults were briefly exposed to diesel exhaust and filtered air at different times in a laboratory setting. Brain activity was measured before and after each exposure. They note the changes in the brain were temporary and brain connectivity returned to normal after the exposure, but they warn effects could be long-lasting if the exposure is continuous. A Canadian Paralympian is crossing the country like Terry Fox did nearly 45 years ago. But instead of running, this athlete is skating, sledge skating to be exact. Corey Bullock brings us this story from Invermere, where the Skate of Hope made its stop in B.C. Since he was a teenager, Tyler McGregor has had an influential role model. You know, I grew up in a small town in southwestern Ontario. We did a Terry Fox run every single year. Um, so from an early age, he became an inspiration um, to me and, and many other people. An inspiration that soon took on a whole new meaning. When I was 15, I, I broke my leg in a hockey game um, and through that recovery process, uh, found out and was diagnosed with spindle cell sarcoma, a uh, form of bone cancer similar to osteosarcoma, which is what Terry Fox had. His left leg was amputated above the knee. Now, McGregor is following Terry Fox's footsteps, but instead of running, he is sledge skating across Canada and fundraising. His goal is $100,000 for the Terry Fox Foundation. I, I hope it's a, a signal of, of possibility um, for anyone. That's what Terry Fox inspired in me, and I hope I can inspire that in other people as well. And Terry Fox uh, did his best to run right across this country, and, and um, it, that was fantastic in his day. And now here we've got Tyler doing the same thing, skating across Canada. McGregor is not on a direct route. Instead, he's skating 42 kilometres in each province, the gruelling distance Terry ran each day. Invermere's White Way is the world's longest wilderness skating trail. The Toby Creek Nordic Club set up these 30 kilometers in 2006. Now, McGregor's third stop on a skate across the country. I think it's a great cause and that everyone should join in. After this, McGregor will carry on to Ottawa and the Rideau Canal to raise awareness and maybe even inspire young athletes.
that being a part of a team teaches you so much about empathy and um, and being a good a good teammate. You know, and I hope this you know this educative hope just kind of inspires young people to understand and that they can do anything they want to. Doing his best to follow in his idol's footsteps. Corey Bullock, CBC News, in Vermeer. What an incredible journey and such an inspiration mm -hmm. to so many, eh, Joanna? Yeah, a, a beautiful story. And I remember those uh, Carrie Fox runs myself at mm -hmm. age 15, and it's neat to see how far that inspiration goes. Uh, we've got the drizzle that we're tracking, Anita, tonight that is going to continue through to tomorrow morning. I can feel it falling softly around me as it has done for most of the day. It is a chilly one out there. It's the kind of day where you didn't need an umbrella or a coat, but the glasses get a fine misting after too long. Let me show you the picture, starting with the radar. And you can see the radar is picking up those fine rain droplets uh, kind of coming through in waves. So it's not a big system, and we didn't see a lot of accumulation, if any, maybe a couple millimeters at most. But that's our story through the overnight as that clockwise flow continues to bring moisture down across the province. And it's also bringing some weather to the interior tonight. Prince George, freezing rain changing over to snow. We'll see some snow in the Okanagan as well. Uh, we'll see temperatures around 5 for uh, Pitt Meadows right now, 6 at YVR. It's been seasonal the past couple of days, and we have seasonal weather uh, for the next couple of days as well as far as temperatures go, but things are changing in the long range. First of all, we get to enjoy sunshine tomorrow afternoon as that high-pressure system finally wins out, Anita. We've got a little system to bring more showers for Thursday, and then I will talk about that big cool-down coming this weekend a little bit later on in the show. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Taylor Swift fans are still fuming over a recent ticket sale disaster and Ticketmaster is now blaming bots for interference. More on whether the organization will be held accountable coming up. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream tonight. The community of Delaney in Northwest Territories is often touted as the birthplace of hockey. Until recently, its rink was less than desirable because it was actually made of gravel. It's now been upgraded to concrete, allowing the community to better develop and nurture future hockey stars. I get great joy out of seeing the kids succeed. Um, I, like, uh, I like teaching them the stuff that I learned through fitness, through healthy living, um, healthy lifestyles, commitments, you know, the dedication, all those things. I love to see them excel in that. If we can produce hockey schools here in the summer, that's our goal, right? Because we really want to create opportunity for our people. We want to create jobs and we want really healthy kids in the future. You know, that's part of our, our investment is that um, investing in the youth, you know, we, in order to build their uh, self-esteem, confidence, we believe recreation is a big part of their life. And we, the leaders, we, in, we invest in stuff like this arena. Dillon has been always a, a proud supporter of hockey. And, um, and we're, we're very happy to be here to uh, celebrate that with our young people in our community. And, um, and uh, I hope, you know, this new uh, resurface uh, arena will last uh, a long time and for the next generation to come. This rink is based on the birthplace of hockey. I grew up playing with my friends. It's the number one sport in Delany. Well, I, uh, it would have a positive impact on the youth for them to get more active and um, have more activities like this to happen, including other sports as well as uh, like volleyball and soccer. Or... I'm most proud of just being able to work in the community. It's pretty incredible to have the opportunity to do an arena renovation in the birthplace of hockey and look around and see what you've done at the end of the day and you know some of the opportunities that this will create for people who live here. Um, so the thing that I'm most proud of is just looking around and seeing the kids that now have the opportunity to skate and have fun at a facility like this and know that it was constructed by our local crew here in Delany. You know, in the end, 
we got a real good facility and I think the message also should be is that we actually have good people uh, that that are working hard to keep our people busy and active and it's a lot easier when uh, we're supporting that initiative we're supporting our staff we're supporting our people bring the kids out and it's not only for kids I mean uh, even the elders should come out and you know be be involved with uh, having fun with their facility Concert promoter Live Nation took center stage itself today in Washington. The company and its subsidiary, Ticketmaster, faced grilling by a Senate committee. Lawmakers were looking for answers to the latest debacle. Last year's uh, debacle over Taylor Swift tickets. Paul Hunter now on what fans fear may become the price of admission. So take a look what you've done. The spark for the hearing was Taylor Swift, one of the most popular performers on the planet. A ticket sale fiasco for a Swift concert tour last year brought fierce criticism for Ticketmaster and its owner, Live Nation, when its retail software effectively had a meltdown, leaving countless Taylor fans ticketless. I'm not against big per se. I am against dumb. Republicans and Democrats alike now taking aim at Live Nation on Capitol Hill. In return, an apology for all. We need to do better, and we will do better. But as well from Live Nation's president, finger-pointing at every concert-goer's arch-enemy, ticket scalpers. Nowadays, most tickets are sold online, but scalpers make automated purchases in bulk and can send prices sky-high. Says Live Nation, the real difficulties are... The direct result of industrial-scale ticket scalping that goes on today. A $5 billion industry in concerts alone in the United States. But lawmakers said more broadly the issue is Live Nation's domination of the marketplace. As I hear and read what you have to say, it's basically, it's not us. It's everyone but us. And the fact of the matter is that Live Nation, Ticketmaster, is the 800-pound gorilla. We need to make sure we have competition to bring prices down and bring innovation in and stop the fiascos. Lawmakers Today, say Live they Nation will continue studying the issue, but there's no clear path forward, as Swift herself might well underline. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. So with increased scrutiny on Ticketmaster, what are the options for artists, consumers, and ticket sellers? UVic economics professor Pascal Cordy is live with us tonight. Pascal, what do you make of the current state of ticket sales and the position of Ticketmaster not taking any responsibility? Well, what happened with, uh, with Taylor Swift is a bit unusual. I, I don't think they, they wanted it, so... But it's bringing back the, 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 um, the you know, everybody to the debate of why, why, you know, why do these things happen? Yeah, because how much sway does the government actually have in holding these ticket sellers responsible here? Well, in the case of uh, Ticketmaster, it's a bit unusual because uh, he, he's in a dominant, uh, Ticketmaster has a dominant position in uh, both venue, large venue and uh, uh, this ticket distribution. And so they are always under the scrutiny of the possible next investigation. But really, is there anything that government can actually do here to hold them accountable? Should government be doing more to hold them accountable? So I think what, what uh, the, the last time uh, we were in, in, in the same position about 10 years ago, the, the U.S. government was seriously considering the possibility of breaking up Ticketmaster. Uh, maybe having a, 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 a unit that does dis distribution and allow more, uh, allow more entry also in distribution and have also another part that would do 
the management of venues, uh, the agents, and, and have uh, so that artists have more people to talk to, and uh, they, they, they can't be, it's not one-stop shopping uh, and no option. And are you hoping that will come out of this current scrutiny that the organization is under? I, I probably not directly, but it could come out of the Department of Justice uh, doing a, a, a possibly looking again at the at the issue and uh, reassessing whether you know the situation in the U.S. Uh, compare it with what what's happening in other countries and whether the dominance of Ticketmaster is for the benefit of consumers. Yeah, because is there any other incentive for Ticketmaster to actually change its current methods? Because right now it really is all about money, right? That's a problem. That's a problem, and especially it's about money. A lot of these, uh, a, a lot of these uh, concerts, Ticketmaster sees them as uh, doesn't have a long-term reputation directly with the fans, and uh, the, trying to squeeze more through uh, fees, a lot of opacity. And also for artists, some artists would like to have access to different options. Some artists truly want to price their tickets at a fairly low price to, to give to pass on money to fans below the resale price, and they want to have a fair lottery. And Ticketmaster is not capable of offering that to the artists that want that option. And then other artists, they want to do more dynamic pricing, to, to maybe squeeze a little more surplus, like doing something a bit more like the airlines. And, and that's... If these artists want to do it that way, that, that's fine too, right? But, but there should be more transparency. The process should be less opaque. Fans should be aware of what their options are. And if it's a lottery, then let's make it clear. It's a, lot, a fair lottery, not the bots getting in the middle. Just quickly here, how realistic is it that change will come? I think eventually, you know, well, there's always the possibility of having an entrant. There's always a possibility of having uh, artists uh, trying to find other solutions. Um, I, I think there's a, there's a possibility because the technology is getting uh, cheaper and cheaper. Let, let's remember the Ticketmaster is there because they were the first one to install all these network in like convenience stores to make tickets available for us across the nation to avoid the problem of double booking. That was a problem initially. Pascal, because, Pascal uh, I, just, I just have to stop you right there because we are out of time, but we really appreciate you joining us tonight. Well, Pascal Cordy is a University of Victoria economics professor. Thank you thank so you. much. We're going to be watching this every step of the way as we get ready for Budget 23. A warning that Canada's economy could be in for a bumpy ride to the tune of tens of potentially billions of dollars. After the break, how Justin Trudeau and the federal Liberals are bracing for the future. Taking it, away was it happened again last night, this time in Quebec City. To Larry Allen, he scores! The Vancouver Canucks won yet another hockey game. Sure, the regular season is barely half over, but the Canucks are on a club record setting pace. Steve Frost, Vancouver Canucks hockey, uh, what, director of hockey information. How you doing? Tell me something, Steve. I'm doing fine. So are the Canucks. Uh, team record for most wins. Most wins, 38, 1974-75. Most points? 86, same year. Steve Frost was nine years old when the Canucks set a club record with those 38 wins. Three times, Vancouver has lost only 32 games in a season, most recently in 1980-81. The single-season points record of 86 has stood for 17 years. So far this season, the Canucks have won twice as many games as they've lost. Throw in the seven ties, and Vancouver has 59 points to show for its 46 games. Projected over the full 80-game schedule, the Canucks would shatter their existing club records and post their first winning season since 1975-76. 1975-76, that was my uh, junior year in college. <laughs> I was uh, completing my junior year and playing college hockey. Here's a two-on-one, Larry Anoff to Burr. Especially this particular one's probably been one of our more popular ones and should increase yeah. with the continued uh, play. The Canucks' rise to the top of the standings has been good for the souvenir business as well. 
Scott Reed manages the Winning Spirit store in the Coliseum, and sales of Canuck items account for 80% of its business, a 20% increase from a year ago. It comes to 7570. One of the more popular items uh, in store this season. I find it hard to believe, but I think you're holding a pair of them. Well, you know, I was going to show you my pair, but of course I can't do that on TV, so it's the Canuck boxer short. Uh, it's been uh, one of those neat items over Christmas time and filtered right through into the new year. Who's your favorite player? Bray. Why? I don't know, because he scores goals. You're going to buy that hat? <laughs> Does your mom know that? Yes. You didn't bring your wallet, did you, or your charge card? Bray shoots, he scores! Clearly, it's shaping up to be a season to remember. No longer are the Canucks labeled losers. I hope that someone has a huge party in the city when we dump that label and pass the, the 500 point, and, uh, and then I hope I never hear about it again. The economy is the number one topic at the Liberal cabinet retreat in Hamilton, Ontario right now. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his ministers were briefed by experts today. And as David Cochran tells us, they're bracing for a bumpy year. Cabinet ministers arrive for a briefing on the state of the economy, knowing full well they've got a tough year ahead. 23 is a turbulent year. There's lots of uncertainty. So we're going to be watching this every step of the way as we get ready for Budget 23. Budget 23 will need to deliver billions for a growing list of needs. New health funding for a system in crisis and in need of reform. Meaningful progress on pharmacare to satisfy the political deal with the NDP. And a clear response to massive clean tech tax incentives in the United States to keep Canada competitive. If you go too far too fast, the Bank of Canada is going to simply uh, ratchet things up and, and, and make the interest rate environment more challenging. So I think that's something we ought to keep in mind for policy in 2023 when it looks at government spending and revenue. These experts briefed the cabinet on the balancing act that's facing them, meeting that list of growing needs while warnings of a recession grow louder. We can expect the economy to slow significantly. We can expect uh, that uh, the unemployment rate will rise, both here in Canada and in other jurisdictions like the U.S., Europe, the U.K. Um, whether or not we'll have a hard landing is something that no one really knows. It's a grim forecast for the year ahead for a government determined to avoid that hard landing of deep job losses and a possible recession. There is still a lot of uncertainty in the world economy. And that means that we do need to continue to take a fiscally prudent approach. Underscoring the challenges the government faces is the possibility of another rate hike from the Bank of Canada. The bank will reveal its latest decision tomorrow, with many experts predicting at least one more hike of a quarter point. David Cochran, CBC News, Hamilton. Coming up, the short film that just received an Oscar nomination about a significant moment in Canadian history.
The Oscar nominations are out, and some Canadians have made the list of notables for the big prize. Domishi is getting the nod for Best Animated Feature for Turning Red, with two nominations going to the work of another Canadian woman. We know that we've not imagined these attacks. We know that we are bruised and terrified. That's Women Talking, directed by Canadian Sarah Poli, critically acclaimed and now Oscar-nominated for Best Picture and Best Adapted Screenplay. She joins other box office behemoths for the biggest nominations of award season, including Avatar, The Way of Water by Canadian James Cameron, Banshees of Inishirin, and Everything Everywhere All at Once, which picked up the most of all with 11 nominations. Two Calgary filmmakers have also been nominated. This is The Flying Sailor, the Calgary animators who made it. Wendy Tilby and Amanda Forbis, they got an Oscar nod this morning for Best Animated Short Film. The Flying Sailor is inspired by the true story of a man who survived being blown skyward by the 1917 Halifax explosion. Tilby told CBC she was shocked and delighted by the honor. This is their third nomination. And an international film that's been making big noise has picked up an Oscar nomination for Best Original Song. The epic RRR is the first all-Indian film to be nominated in the category. The song Natu Natu is up against four other movie tunes and has already won a Golden Globe. And as the CBC's Eli Glasner tells us, it's not the only thing about RRR that's breaking new ground. <laughs> Watching RRR is not your normal night at the movies. At this LA screening, the audience stormed the stage. We just saw everyone starting to rush up and we're like, we, we have to do it. It just, it caught on, it, 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 was, it was infectious. This is the power of RRR, a movie smashing records and winning over audiences worldwide. It was fascinating to see the audience love a movie in the way the Indians love it and not just love it passively. The story generating all this passion follows two freedom fighters battling the colonial powers. It comes from S.S. Rajamuli, a director known for his audacious cinema style. Whether it's these large, oversized animals jumping right at you, or you see one man fending off like 500 bodies, it's just incredible visual storytelling. Part of what makes RRR special is where it's from. Most Bollywood films come from Mumbai, where the language spoken is Hindi. But RRR is a Telugu language film from southern India's Tollywood region. This Guelph student saw the film five times and will never forget her first experience. But instantly, like the second it started playing, the adrenaline was up and it kind of just stayed up the whole time. My heart was beating really fast and I just, I was like on the edge of my seat. Now RRR is winning over fans like James Cameron and racking up wins at the Critics' Choice and Golden Globe Awards. <laughs> Suggesting what's considered a worthy film could be changing. That they can be loud and rambunctious and celebratory and perhaps bizarre and uh, utterly unrealistic, but also uh, deliver a story that is as truthful to the people watching it as it can be. Oscars or not, she says RRR has already proved itself with the audience it was made for. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Huge for RRR, so great to yeah. see. And here at the CBC, some big praise for the movie from you, our very own Joanna Wagstaff. <laughs> It's true. I'm not, uh, you know, Eli Glasner level of film critic, but this was one of my favorite films of 2022. Wow. It was like the best action, best buddy comedy uh, that I've ever seen. It was so much fun and uh, yeah, highly, highly recommended. I got to learn the, some of those dance moves, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Next CBC talent show, you're up. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I got a year to work on it. Uh, yeah, give me, give, me, give me some time. I wish that the weather forecast was going to be coming with explosives and uh, tigers jumping on screen, but I do have some interesting <laughs> weather to talk about, starting with the temperatures. And we know they're going to take a bit of a nosedive as we head into 
next weekend. But you can see that Arctic air mass in purple hanging on through central Canada. That's the air mass that will eventually track westward toward our coast Saturday night into Sunday. Okay, until then, look for clearing skies tomorrow. It'll be nice to get through that drizzle in the morning, perhaps some morning fog too. The rain is back for Thursday, and then Friday that low pressure system skirts out and we're back to the sunshine. So sunshine tomorrow afternoon, Thursday rain, Friday sun. Uh, the system, the couple systems that we're getting, bringing some good snowpack snow. We'll see that both both for the coastal mountains and the interior, we will have to watch avalanche conditions with all of that fresh snow on top of uh, unstable conditions. Uh, watch that purple air mass, though. Here it is Saturday, pushing into BC, fresh waves, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So we're on the edge of that air mass that will encompass all of Canada. This isn't just a BC story getting cold. It's everyone, but yet yeah, more unusual than not to see it all the way down to the south coast. And there are those temperatures you can see Saturday night, Sunday night, we'll be dropping a good 10 degrees from our seasonal. Uh, and those temperatures will stay cool. So far, cool and clear, but I'll have to watch for a potential snowmaker Wednesday next week. So kind of seasonal and soggy with some sunny breaks over the next few days. And then Anita will look for that Arctic air mass. Coming soon to a an outdoor near you. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving us plenty of notice, so hopefully this time we're actually prepared for it. Yes, hopefully. I'll keep you posted. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. And what are you up to this evening? Coming up, a creative way to deal with pandemic loneliness, brought to you by your local grocery store. Fun at the Forks on the ice. One of Canada's longest outdoor skating trails is now at its longest length for the season. Beginning at the Hugo Docks on the Assiniboine River, the trail now stretches through central Winnipeg all the way to Churchill Drive. Many look forward to it all year. It gets people out. You can meet friends here. You can have a coffee, come for dinner, have a skate. You can come on a date. You can come with your kids. It's kind of fun for everyone. It's a place to go and be out in the fresh air instead of being, you know, walking in a mall or something like that. Yeah, You're exactly. outside. And you get to see things in a totally different <laughs> venue, being on the ice and that or on the river and you're looking up at these buildings and you're just seeing something completely different about the city. The length of the trail varies each year depending on the weather and is tested daily for integrity. This season it runs just over six kilometers. The trail was renamed last year to honor the original Cree name used for the Forks. Three points Nestawea means when people have come together from different directions, three different directions to come and live in this place permanently. The Cree from the north, uh, the Assiniboine or Lakota people from the west, and the Anishinaabe from the south. You know, part of that is through laughter and through fun and through community, and that's what this river trail is all about. The trail ends here, Churchill Drive. People can come down, skate around this circle before making their way back. It's one of three access points on the trail, and officials say only use those access points as other areas could be unsafe. Other safety tips include going slow under bridges where the ice can be bumpy and uneven, and to be mindful of maintenance crews and their equipment. Tractors, Zambonis, even flooding machines are all in use here on the trail. Visitors can also bike, skate, and cross-country ski along the trail's path, and the trail is entirely free to use, so get on the ice while it lasts. Matt Humphrey, CBC News, Winnipeg.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Celebrate the city's most impactful leaders with Anita Bath at the annual Vancouver Magazine Power 50 Awards. Join the fun February 2nd at the Terminal City Club. Learn more and get tickets at vanmag.com and never miss a special programming series, event, or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox and keep connected with us. A supermarket in Edmonton has introduced what it is calling a slow lane. It's for people who want to interact more with each other and with the cashier. As Julia Wong tells us, it's helping people with pandemic loneliness. Hello, my dear. It's pretty obvious. Jason Rutledge oh. likes to chat. And what are you up to this evening? The Sobeys cashier's infectious energy often draws a crowd. When you ask, why do they come to me, I have no idea. But I do know, like, for me, I come here for them. So the Edmonton grocery store started a social slow lane where people can take as long as they want. It was fine. I can turn on any lane into a slow lane. Because <laughs> I'm retired now, so I have nothing but time. <laughs> In a world of express lanes and self-checkouts, this lane is a reminder it's okay to slow down and have a chat. Good afternoon, Julia. Hello, Jason. It's great to see you again. <laughs> the pandemic created the need. The store had the right people for the job. COVID's kind of isolated us, or it's, it's sort of divided us. They were there for social interaction. They were there for, you know, really to get their, their soul's worth. Get a little bit of love from Jason, I guess. Encounters can range from mere seconds to many minutes. Oh, that's the thing. And can vary nice. from sports to work to the deeply personal. Because you never know. Like every day is something new and exciting and it's crazy. It, I love it. And that little bit of love can go a long way. All right. In general, if I have some time, I really, would, I really like this kind of contact. Before I came in here, it was like, blah. And now, <laughs> He makes you laugh and it makes you feel better. For Rutledge, the check out is all about checking in on others. I look at the time that I have with these people as a very, it's our conversations especially are very sacred to me. Conversations that are good for the soul. You have a great day, brother. <laughs> Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Yeah, definitely not for the person trying to avoid conversation, trying to stay low key in the grocery store, but how great. So maybe we all need a little more random, positive conversation in our life. And that brings us to the end of our conversation tonight. We'll see you tomorrow right here on CBC Vancouver News.